Hey everybody, thanks for joining us for this uh, panel discussion on making Drupal more accessible. But we're also going to sort of cover a range of, uh, of topics. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, is Drupal really the most accessible CMS out there? How would we know? What would that mean? Uh, what are you excited about in WCAG 2.1, 2.2, and Silver? What should developers know going ahead? How quickly will it change? Three, what is this Bill C81 thing and how does it apply to me? Uh, what effects do you hope it will have for creating more accessible Canada? And so if you don't know what uh, Bill C81 is, you're about to find out. And AI, how much is hype? Where can we realistically see AI being used in our web projects in the near future? Um, so yeah, so um, let's just introduce ourselves. Oh. So first, uh, Denis Goudreau. Hello. <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so my name is Denis. I uh, live here in Montreal. Uh, I've been working in web accessibility for 19 years or so. Um, currently working mostly with a company in the US called Wiki Systems. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I don't, I don't think the mic's on. Yeah, that's why I'm wondering. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll just turn it up right now. Stand for okay. So, um, so yes, working for this American company called DQ Systems, you may have heard of them. You may have heard of a tool that we developed called Axe for uh, accessibility automated testing. Uh, so that's one of the things that we do, and, and a lot of uh, assessments, training, and stuff like that. I'm involved with the W3C in developing the accessibility standards, looking into the future of those standards as well, and and a bunch of other things related to how we can integrate accessibility in. The life cycle in general. That's kind of what I do. Mm -hmm. and, and not a Drupal user, which is kind of <laughs> ironic, uh, but, uh, but here to maybe give a different perspective on some of the things mm -hmm. that Mike will be super excited about. <laughs> and Mike thinks that Denis may have the most um, accessibility related tattoos out of anyone in the entire world. Oh, in the entire <laughs> world. <laughs> so, never Seems possible. That, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mike. Uh, so yeah, I'm a Drupal Core Accessibility Maintainer, I'm with Andrew McPherson. Um, I'm also uh, the, the, uh, the CEO and founder of Open Cost Consulting. I sit on things like the Open Source Advisory Board for Treasury Board Secretary of Canada, and uh, generally you know, I'm involved in the accessibility community with, with, with unconferences. Uh, the first uh, conference, LA conference that I was organized was, was supported very much by me and, and Jenison who came for that to, to Ottawa. Uh, but you know, support our people learning and sharing information about accessibility uh, through, through events like uh, uh, the Toronto Accessibility Camp. Right on. Uh, my name is Laura Johnson. I'm a software developer at My Planet. Um, I've been a Drupal developer for over 10 years, and my, my planet uh, does a lot of Drupal. We started as a Drupal shop, and now it's about 50% uh, uh, Drupal projects and 50% uh, for more full stack JavaScript. Um, I've uh, written a couple of accessibility related articles. Uh, the last one I interviewed Denny for, uh, that was an article on web accessibility and machine learning. Um, and if you want to read that, it's online. Um, you can find it probably just by uh, Googling it or by finding me on Twitter. Um, I've got a slide with our Twitter, Twitter handle is coming up after, afterwards. Um, and I'm an organizer of Drupal Lore. Woo woo! <laughs> okay, all right. So, to the first topic. Is Drupal really the most accessible CMS out there? How do we know? What would that mean? I've said it many times, and nobody has contradicted me and said that there's a more accessible CMS, so therefore it must be the most accessible CMS out there. <laughs> Done. Mic drop. <laughs> so does that mean you move on to the next question? Or? <laughs> well, it's, it's actually it's interesting. I think that uh, I think Carl Burroughs went off and, and released something um, looking at CMSs and accessibility, and, and CMSs in the wild. And in his evaluation, actually, WordPress did better than Drupal on the implementation side um, of, of public-facing websites. Um, so that's that's definitely something that, that gave us some some thought and things to consider about. 
But um, as we know, WordPress completely fell on their face with Gutenberg, and none of the back end of, of uh, WordPress is now accessible thanks to the Gutenberg project. So Drupal has had a commitment to having the front end and back end accessible uh, since Drupal 7, thanks to uh, Eric Zufeld, who was at one point uh, an open concept staff member, and it's now with my plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, so yeah, and Drupal also has um, a couple of uh, cool items that I'm not sure if everyone will know about, which is um, the Oral Alerts. So Drupal Announce is uh, something that's incorporated into Core now, right? Yep, absolutely. So there, we introduced a bunch of stuff in Drupal um, that, that helps make it easier for, for users to be able to create accessible websites. Um, in Drupal 7, we introduced uh, sort of alternatives to CSS display none. Mm -hmm. And uh, so visually hidden, this is how it's structured in, in, in Drupal 8. We're sort of taking the, the HTML5 version of uh, the code and brought that to uh, the, the HTML5 boilerplates uh, language and brought that into to Drupal to try and broaden broaden the, have a more broad, broad consensus in terms of terminology and make it easier for people to adapt it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but the, the, um, the, the, the Drupal announce function uh, helps you implement area live functionality. So whenever you're, if you have any dynamic content in your website, your web page changes over time, you need to have something that alerts the screen reader to say that, that the content has changed. And, and Drupal announce is a, an easy JavaScript uh, Helper function that allows you to do that in a clear, consistent way. And again, if there's if there's any because it's being handled in a centralized location, if there's if the best practice for handling that dynamic content changes, you can fix it in one spot. Probably the Drupal community will fix it in one spot, and you will just inherit the best practice um, with with the next up, next security update with Drupal Core. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's that's just it. So if a region of the page changes, then you know, a person using a screen reader is not going to be aware of that change. So you can choose to announce it to them. Uh, and I think that you can announce it uh, in passive mode or aggressive mode. And passive basically waits until... But not passive aggressive mode. Not passive aggressive mode, no. <laughs> um, we haven't introduced that yet. <laughs> um, right. Uh, so, go ahead. so then uh, the question I want to ask you is, as someone who's not using Drupal, um, but is using CMS in general, or especially assessing CMS in general, and what they produce. Um, so you keep talking about accessibility, as you refer to screen readers, we hear that a lot. You like to think it's the most accessible CMS out there. So uh, beyond screen readers, beyond maybe even a particular screen reader that you may be using with your computer, what kind of work has been done to make that claim, to, to be able to do that claim. Like mm -hmm. keyboard access, um, voice recognition software, other types of assistive technologies beyond screen readers. What kind of work has been done so far? Well, not enough. Um, but but I'm confident that we've done more work than anyone else has, which is just sort of the sad state of affairs, is that they're like Dragon Naturally Speaking. I would love to go off and find out what some best practices are for implementing Dragon Naturally Speaking that we can incorporate into core. I can't find anyone who's got who's, who's got a good case study of what are the best practices for implementing the Dragon Naturally Speaking that we can learn from. There should be some, um, but we're not going to get any help from Dragon Naturally Speaking because they don't believe that this is actually an assistive technology device. And the assistive technology users, I think that the, the Dragon users, I don't think are a community that are, have have gathered together and are actively looking at ways to go up and to, to, to work as a community. So if we had had a Dragon Naturally Speaking user in, in the Drupal community that wanted to give some advice and direction, then we'd definitely be able to act on that. But, but we don't have any. So we're, we're, we're very much limited to who we have access to in the community and who's willing to step up and say, here's the problems that we face. Um, but but it's you know we're, but Drupal such a, has such a large footprint like it's a it's over a million websites around the world it's three percent of the web um, it's driving websites from like the CNIB that we built to the RNIB to AbilityNet like there's there's enough organizations out there in the disability sector in the government sector in the education sector that 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 have tested and evaluated this tool for their own purposes um, that you know I, yeah I, 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 we haven't done enough, but but I don't think anyone else has done more. Fair enough. And, and and would you feel that like if you were to 
try and evaluate, maybe you did, maybe, maybe your team did, um, try to evaluate just how much accessibility comes out of the box with Drupal and how much is then required by developers to sort of go to distance to really make mm -hmm. it accessible. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it, 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 part of it comes down to, to any, any software that, that uh, is open source, you can customize it to meet whatever your requirements are. And so just swapping out one theme from another can very easily throw off the accessibility of, of your site. Um, but what we've tried to do in, in core is to build in those accessibility best practices by default so that that it's that what is coming we can get bundled with core whether it's in the umami theme um, whether or it's in the, the new admin theme um, that that is being tested for at least you know it's being tested for accessibility and, and that there's a um, not that it's it's being fully tested and that there are going to be some errors but that it's accessibility issues are clearly a bug and, and things can't get into uh, core as a stable release until we've, we've addressed that. And that does include things like our, um, the, the layout builder module, like a lot of work has been done on the, the, uh, the layout builder module, thanks to, uh, to Tim and others to try and, and, and to, to make sure that these new initiatives are building in some best practices for, for everyone, including keyboard only users and screen readers. Mm -hmm. And there are sort of good examples that you can look to in the core code. Like if, if you're a developer and you want to design something well, you know, there are generally examples of, of accessible ways to do that in, in the code. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. we, we do believe that, that, the, that generally developers are lazy, sorry, <laughs> um, to, for the developers here. And then we will always look for patterns in the code that we're using to replicate in order to go off and do what we're trying to do as quickly as and as effectively and as to fit in the matter of the patterns we're trying to build. So if we build in good patterns that are patterns that can be used by like those are the patterns that can be used and reused and reused. Whereas if we if you if you take the approach that so many um, software companies have done and said we're going to go off and create an accessibility plugin that will bring up your code base from from what's in core to to an accessible level like well. Only the accessibility geeks are going to notice and care about that, mm -hmm. as opposed to everyone, and, and trying to set that default so that, that the assumptions of the community and the culture is that accessibility is, 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 is something that is of, of core importance. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned something earlier about uh, what happened in Gutenberg, uh, WordPress 5, and how they found their face with that. Um, is there any any uh, effort going on or any, any idea around comparing the latest version of WordPress with the version of Drupal in terms of accessibility? Um, there, there's, there's more communication now between the WordPress community and the Drupal community, which is good, both in terms of uh, security, accessibility, and privacy. Uh, from a privacy perspective, WordPress is way ahead of us. Um, but the but in terms of, of, of comparison, there's, there really isn't that much, even just in terms of reuse of patterns. We're, we're getting to the point where there's, there's a greater level of conversation between our communities. Um, and, and, it's, uh, and there are, like there is a Gutenberg Drupal module. Has, has anyone played the Gutenberg Drupal module? No, okay, one person sort of, Nathan has sort of done a little bit of it. Right, right, okay. So, so it, it's there, um, and and there's there's also um, uh, the, the there's a, a, an admin UI team that's looking at, at building a React implementation of of, uh, of the Drupal admin interface, which is is this is facing the same problem that Gutenberg had. Like that's what they they were the challenge they were trying to meet. Mm -hmm. um, but but again, that core team has a has a commitment to accessibility and is building that testing infrastructure into the work that they're doing, I think leveraging Axe Core. So there's at least a basic understanding of at least automated testing. Cool. All right. Um, not that we're leaving the top of Drupal, but let's move on and we can refer back to Drupal in the next topic too. So just, just a quick thing. So I think that WordPress is the second most successful CMS. <laughs> And I don't know who the third or fourth would be. Do you have any thoughts on uh, that out of box? Be, would be hard for us to say. Based on experience, um, most of the 
insights that we are seeing or assessing are given by CMS are either Drupal or Polish or working as by far. Um, we see Joomla every now and then, but there's nothing really worth mentioning there. Right. Um, it's been a while since I've noticed any other patterns that were that were worth mentioning. Okay. And accessibility per se is not a topic that we often find in products like these, except for Drupal and, and WordPress, like you said. I mean, I, I've, I've known Mike for yeah, I, I've known Mike for about what, ten years, I think. And I remember I've, since I've known him, it's always been Drupal is the best one, and then it was version six was the best one, and version seven was the best one, and version eight was the best one. So I think I haven't heard that often enough. And, but, but yeah, I've never seen it like a benchmark that compares against very specific points to say, here's why we can claim this. With Gutenberg, and what recently happened in the, the, the audit that was conducted by, by Tenen, uh, they still ended up reporting a 329 page document of issues found in that, in that version. So there's a lot of problems with it for sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, did someone have a question? Yeah, so um, we're talking here also a lot about bin interfaces, but how about this, you know, Drupal community is pushing hard on the headless? And I'm wondering mm. what you're seeing there. Because already, you know, I went to the headless uh, conference on Wednesday, and people were kind of sheepishly admitting that they had to do everything by hand and from scratch. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, what about headless Drupal, which is obviously becoming, and, and other CMS, which is becoming more and more of a thing, and uh, and how do we sort of extend accessibility to to headless applications? Can we go? Okay, I have much to say about that. <laughs> All right, um, so I would say that, that that one of the big advantages of Drupal is that there's all these default patterns that have been tested from the front end. And if you're just doing a native React implementation, you're going to have to go off and, and remake every single pattern in order to go off and to do that. And React isn't particularly set up to give you good defaults. So you can't necessarily trust, trust that the, the implementation that, that you're, you're copying to go off and to build your, your, your prototype is going to be accessible. Um, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but the Gatsby implementation, I am fairly confident, will be um, give you a, lot, a better head start. So because Marcy Sutton's there and Preston so, there are people who, are, who understand accessibility and are committed to that as part of their, 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 their vision of how Gatsby will evolve and are trying to go off into building best practices in the documentation, in the code examples, and in the, 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 the software that they're building themselves to see that, that there are best practices in, in place so that, that developers, if you're at least following the best practices of Gatsby, that you'll be able to implement a, a reasonably accessible um, uh, headless front end for Drupal. Yeah. Yeah, it would be interesting to follow React as well, because React is, is pretty, pretty big in terms of uh, headless Drupal. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to see if there are uh, good, accessible defaults brought into React as well. No more divs for everything. Yes. <laughs> Use semantic HTML. HTML is built for a purpose. Okay, let's move on to the next topic, which is what are you excited about in WCAG 2.1, 2.2, and Silver? What should developers know going ahead? How quickly will it change? Um, so yeah, so I had a chance to uh, look back at uh, 2.1 a little bit today, and I was trying to think of um, you know sort of what are the the 2.1 the new items that that you know could be potentially addressed in the CMS, for example, um, uh, things like um, label in name. So this is where um, if you have a submit button, the label the text that you have in the label needs to match the text that you have in the name attribute so that someone who's uh, speaking the, I, I think this is perfect, but the, so someone that speaks, submits, and submits you know, by voice, um, it has to, to match the label or else they won't be saying the right command. Well, the, the name attribute or the, ex the accessible name of that object. Right. Like for instance, if you had an ARIA label, that would be the equivalent of that in that particular case. Right. Having, having something that 
having a match between what you see visually and what is actually in the code underneath. So that if you're speaking to trigger that one button, for instance, you call that button by its name that you visually see, it refers to something underneath in the source code so that there's, there can be a match. Oftentimes, we're talking around here about the language you're speaking, one of the situations that arise that were not covered in WCAG 2.0, the previous version of WCAG, was that if you had a, a, a mismatch or a disconnect between what you were visually seeing and what was given as the accessible link for that button, you would try to trigger that button by saying click purchase, for instance, and purchase would not resonate because underneath, underneath maybe the, the, the name for the button or the object is, I don't know, like buy or, or something mm -hmm. like that, for instance. And therefore, there isn't a match, and, and therefore you can't trigger that thing because it doesn't find what you're looking for. With that success criterion, we're basically ensuring that there's there's a, a match between both representations, so that when you speak that particular command, it resonates to something, it maps to something that exists in the in the, in the DOM. Right. So that is one example for sure where yeah. you can standardize a lot of that in, 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 the, in core or areas of, of Drupal. Yeah, and in that case, I don't know if that's something that we would put an example of into like the Drupal core or... So, so, so there's, for, for people who are not familiar with, with the Drupal issue queue, there's an accessibility tag mm -hmm. that's that's uh, got all kinds of issues in there. If you just look at the accessibility issue, you think, the issue queue, you think that, that Drupal is just like the worst ex for, for accessible period because there's so many errors that are listed there. Things that we're working on, things we're aware of, things that the people have reported that need to be verified. We also have a Debicade 2.1 tag that uh, Andrew McPherson has been pushing and they're doing some work to try and uh, make that, that make that relevant. So we're trying to identify issues that are Debicade 2.1 issues. Um, as yet, there are no well Debicade 2.2 is not yet, but but at some point when that is is released, or probably you know um, Andrew will go off and, and come up with a, a list of issues that we can can identify in, in Debicade 2.2. Um, there's also an ATAG issue queue as well, so you know, Drupal's done more than any other CMS, I think, to go off and deal with ATAG, which is the Authoring Tool Accessibility Guidelines, Part A and B. Um, so that's, that also is something that sets us apart from everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and again, there's that, that issue queue for, for identifying those issues. Um, but, but in terms of what's, I think that the cognitive stuff is really quite exciting with, with, uh, with 2.1. Um, I think that, that has has a lot of interesting potentials because it's. I think there's a lot of people in 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 the world that have cognitive disabilities or learning disabilities or language challenges, and so bringing bringing that into um, into to focus, I think, is, is, is wonderful. So, so your question is like, what are we excited about? Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe to general what you just said. So. One of the biggest issues that we had building 2.0 and then 2.1 and now 2.2 and also Silver, like all these different things, is that back in 2008 when 2.0 was, was released, um, it was the work of the past seven years building up to a stable version of, of what can be done. Um, and by 2008, in the couple of years that preceded that, well, for one thing, there wasn't any no such thing as mobile experiences per se. So there was a big lack in what we could cover in terms or predict in terms of accessibility needs for any mobile experience. Um, and then what can be this very political arena where you're trying to get your issues across and you're competing with a bunch of other people that also have their own issues that they want to get see addressed in the standard. Um, who ended up winning were basically the bigger lobbies. So the American Federation of the Blind, the American Federation of the Deaf, National Federation of the Blind, like the bigger lobbies that were more represented or had more ability to, to support the effort were still standing at the end. And, and when, if, you were, if you've ever worked in standardization, you know that it doesn't really matter if you fight really hard at the beginning, the person who wins is the person who's still standing at the very end of that process. So in like an eight year process, a lot of people dropped at some point and whatever issue that they had were never really either brought into the standard or did not make it to the level A or AA conference levels, which are basically the ones that really matter because everybody pretty much sets their standard to or scope to AA. So everyone or most things that were relevant to someone who had a low vision issue as opposed to being blind or someone who had a cognitive issue, for instance, 
and could not get represented because they don't have as much of a lobby as, as the blind people that would do, for instance, they all ended up either not being addressed or ended up being at the third level or AAA level. So for the last 10 years working with WCAG, there really wasn't much that was being done or that we could do if we wanted to create an accessible website and yet help people that had low vision or people that had cognitive issues because it wasn't part of our scope. So what I'm excited about, and said all that, what I'm excited about in 2.1 is the idea that the reason why it exists in the first place is to bridge those gaps. Introduce new success criteria for, for mobile experiences, introduce mobile uh, success criteria for low vision issues, and this one success criterion for cognitive, because there's only one that ended up making it to, to this version. So not as much as we'd like to, but there's a whole backlog of, of potential success criteria that did not make it to 2.1 that will maybe make it to 2.2. Now that most things that were raised as needs in 2.1 for low vision and mobile have been addressed. So there's hope that we can cover more of this in, in 2.2 or 2.x because when we think about the future of WCAG, and I'm not getting to silver just yet, but the, the future of WCAG, we regularly joke about when we get to WCAG 2.17, we'll still find a couple of things. I mean, AR, VR, and all these other things eventually will need to be addressed um, as part of this paradigm that is, that is WCAG as we know it today, like the web content accessibility guide as we see it today. So that, that's what I'm excited about, is, is not so much whether or not it gets applied more broadly, because I think we are nationally winning, like we are progressively winning that fight every year. There's more people that, that sort of abide by this and, and, and want to do this. Mm -hmm. But this idea that we can sort of wrangle the technologies and bring them in so that eventually they are also covered. Right, out in the sky. Yeah. Just, just, do people know what silver is? No. Okay. Um, or 2.2 for that matter. Like, I've heard it too much, but I was Googling, I was like. Well, I'm happy to talk more, but yeah. I've already spoken for like two or three minutes. Yeah, so. cool, cool. You're the best person to talk about. Yeah. But well, see, see, here's how that works. So, 2.1 is the latest version as of June 5th of last year. So, it's, it's, it's just it's already a year, um, like a week ago. Um, and 2.2 is the next iteration of that standard. So, we, you might you might find uh, if you're googling the stuff you might find references to say Google 2.x or Google uh, or I, I'm just Google 2.x WCAG 2.x or WCAG.next for instance. Um, it's because we're 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 keeping it we're keeping our, our, our horizons open if that makes any sense. Where uh, we we recognize that we could have multiple versions of the standard now. What's important to understand when it comes to WCAG is that if you, if today you are sort of debating whether or not you want to do 2.1 or 2.0, they're the exact same thing. 2.1 is exactly like 2.0, except that it has 17 new success criteria, get criteria into it. So it's really not a matter of choosing, it's a matter of whether or not you want to introduce the new, the newer success criteria that exists today. So 2.2, is, is an exercise that just started a couple months ago, where we're looking at that next iteration. And if, you, if you're familiar with, uh, with the HTML5 standard, for instance, you know that it's now a living standard. It doesn't have a version anymore, and the idea is that it's, it's, it's a living document. So we're leaning towards that, that mentality as well, where we want to have 18 month cycles, where we release whatever is ready, and then we just keep going and going and going. So if, if there's still issues that are raised by people with disabilities when they use web content, um, five years from now, maybe that will make it into WCAG 2.4, for instance, or 2.5. So we don't know how long that's going to last, but as long as there's a need to create new success criteria, we will. That's basically the idea. And the more technologies evolve, the more, the, the more ubiquitous, ubiquitous the web becomes, as we're using it on a bunch of different devices that are not computers or mobile devices, for instance, the more issues you might are likely to, to, to raise as a result of that. So the yeah, idea will be to, to address those things. Again, virtual reality, augmented reality, those are all examples of situations where it will bring new challenges that we have not thought about yet. The voice interface is the same thing. It brings challenges that we have not yet thought about much because up until recently, speech impairments weren't really a problem when, if you were using the web. 
But if all of a sudden, if your interface is now an invisible interface, and you're only communicating with Alexa, for instance, that's still web, but there's an issue with how you can communicate. So what are your options? So fixing those things is, is also part of what that is. Having said all that, this is all web content. And silver is the next generation of accessibility standards to go beyond the web, to just talk about accessibility in the di digital space much more broadly. And, uh, and it's called silver simply because, um, so WCAG stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. The WCAG Working Group was renamed the AG Working Group last year or the year before, so the Accessibility Guidelines Working Group, because we want to go beyond the web. And geeks being geeks, AG is the, is the, is the chemical, uh, in the table of, of the periodic table of elements, stands for silver. So AG became silver, so silver became the code name for, for the standard. Ultimately, it's going to be named something else. It's not going to be named silver for sure. But it, it was enough of an idea that one of the, one of the goals in, in silver is that we go beyond this idea of just the checklist. Because one of the, one of the things that people like, like myself, like Mike, like Laura, and others who work in accessibility will say regularly is that accessibility is not just a checklist. So you can't just check off things and then you're done. You have the whole holistic approach to it that's also important, the experience that users have and getting them involved and getting their feedback and all that stuff. So Silver has this goal to go beyond just a set of requirements to also include uh, like an actual exercise in making your content more usable to people with disabilities because you've involved them in that process. So getting, getting their own feedback and using that to make yourself better. So what we're working with, instead of having like a level A, double A, and triple A, as in WCAG, what we're currently working with is this idea that we're going to have like a bronze level, silver level, or gold level. And then if you do the equivalent of a WCAG compliant site, it would be bronze. That would be like your entry level. And then if you start doing other things, like involving users in your testing, you would eventually go to silver and, and so gold. So it's like ISO standard, like, oh, is your process Made like some standard process that you guys yeah have pretty much pretty much um, so it's broadening it's broadening the, the the scope so that it's not just a question of checking off a bunch of check of items on a checklist but rather creating experience that will be as usable as, as possible to people that have disabilities so like hypothetically let's say there's a site and you test it with people only as the very last step they would fail right. Well, they most likely would fail because a lot of the issues that you would not be able to predict would would come up at that point. As opposed to if you introduce people with the in the process earlier, they could find those things earlier. And as you know, I mean, the later you, the more time it takes for you to find a bug in your system, the more costly and complicated it would be to fix it. So it's always this idea of shifting left and bringing as early on as possible in that process. It's true for accessibility in in general. If you, if you integrate accessibility in your process at the design level, you will avoid a bunch of issues if you only think about it at the end. And if you involve your users in the process early enough, then they will help you avoid some of the common pitfalls the same way. So yeah, in that sense, it would be easier if you did, if you did that earlier. That's great news. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If people actually do that, because they won't, they won't ever have to. I mean, much in the same way that when, so, so see, when, when WCAG 2 was introduced, with this idea of level of conformance, people were expecting that not everybody would want to go to triple A, but nobody sort of expected that double A would become the scope for most people, or the baseline for most people. So it could very well be that in silver, if it stays bronze, silver, and gold like that, that most people are going to say, you know what, bronze is good enough. Let's just aim for that. Like the government of Canada, for instance, with the new law that, that just came in, mm -hmm currently sets at the bar at WCAG2.0, they could very well at some point say, you know what, we're going to shift to silver or whatever it's called, and now our goal is to reach bronze. So you would still establish a baseline and then not a lot of people would go beyond that. So same idea as a lot of people, most people never bothered looking at the performance of this criteria in WCAG2. So they're, they're, it's a double-edged sword, I guess, but the, the possibility to do it exists. With, I mean, will exist. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking probably five years before it's actually there. Even though some of us are, like to say it's going to be there in three years, I don't, like being part of those meetings every week, I don't believe it. But, um, but five years is probably reasonable. 
as you said, um, being involved in the Drupal core community, like, like it takes a lot of patience and perseverance to do that. Not quite as much as it takes to be involved in the, 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 the changes around Drupal.org. That takes a whole other level of patience and whatnot. But, but being involved in the WC3 community and the mailing lists and the discussions, and, and it, that, that takes a whole, whole other layer of, of, of patience and determination, especially to, to have the, the determination to have sat through those meetings and, and got to know the people and, and deal with the, the struggles for as long as, as, as people like yourself have to exist. Thank you. First few months. It, it just takes a particular mindset, I think. Right. And having a boss that pays part of your salary to do that also helps quite a bit, honestly. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, serious, I mean, I mean, the, the, most, the most important contributors are the ones that are backed by their, their employers for X percentage of, of hours each week. Yeah. It's much easier for you to keep fighting a good fight if you're being paid to do it than yeah. if you die on your own time. So, and back to what I was saying earlier, that's what I for most people. They're, they're fighting for this really important thing that would make a huge difference in someone else's lives and other people's lives, but they're doing that on their free time when they have some, so they can't keep up. And then, and then they end up having big problems at some point. So, thank you, but you know, I'm also blessed to have someone who supports me though. Yeah, totally. Okay, we don't have too much time left. Uh, let's just briefly touch on what is this Bill C81 thing and how does it apply to me? What effects do you hope it will have for creating a more accessible Canada? Um, so I can start. Uh, mm -hmm. So Bill C81 is an act that was proposed by the Liberals that, that is um, in the next week or two will be uh, going from Parliament to the to Rideau Hall and becoming law. Uh, it, had, uh, it had unanimous consent from the uh, from Parliament. Uh, it was there's a there's a couple things were added by the Senate that made it um, harder um, and more difficult. So, uh, which is good. There, the, one of the things that you, we're, we're going to see as part of this is is a lot more sign language uh, with with official government communications. So uh, we'll have ASL, QSL, uh, more with with the the uh, official communications. Um, just like we have English and French right now. Um, but it's essentially to, to go off and to take the, um, the current WK, we can to a WK 2.0 AA standards for public facing websites and say, this has to apply to both the public facing website and the internal facing your back end stuff. So your admin interface can no longer be your crappy code that's completely inaccessible. You're going to need to have to, to build in processes to deal with, with Accessibility in the digital front. There's there's a, a lot of work on, on the built environment to try and make sure that that's accessible on transportation, on employment, and to to, to make sure that the government of Canada becomes um, ideally the, the most uh, accessible public sector employee in, in, in the world, and that that the, the it's not just related to the government of Canada. This also affects any federally regulated industry. So if you're in telecommunications, transportation, or finance. Uh, then, then these regulations apply to you as well, and you're going to have to, to take on many of the, the responsibilities for, for supporting people with disabilities, both inside and outside your organization, by law. Uh, it seems like, uh, I mean, the government often buys, like, off-the-shelf software. Um, I mean, would you say that? So, say so? So, I mean, um, in that sense, you know, are, are they going to have to start looking more at you know, the accessibility level of the software, or just demanding that their, their providers are looking at accessibility for interfaces. I think right now there are a lot of problems. So part, part of the, part of the coverage relates to procurement, mm -hmm. or like the procurement and the delivery of uh, products and services in general. Very similar to what we have in the US uh, for something like this. And if you're a if you're an agency who builds websites, for instance, for the federal government, you are probably already expected to deliver an accessible website. Unless you work with someone in the government that's completely clueless about what's been going on, they should have asked you for that stuff. Um, but up until this point, up until Bill C Bill C eighty one, it was not enforced in any way. It was a standard for the government. It was strongly su uh, suggested or. or recommended, but that was it. As of when the law comes into effect, 
it becomes an actual law, so you have to do it. So, so to maybe run it a little bit more than, than Mike just did, any organization that is, um, that is uh, federally regulated, I guess in English is what you'll say, um, in the, both, of the, in both in the public and private sector, now need to abide by these rules. So same with CAC 2.0. If you're, if you're familiar with the AODA in, in Ontario, this is basically the same thing, but extending to the entire country for anything that, uh, that, that, uh, that sort of is regulated by the government, basically. Um, so yeah, so any, if, so any products or anything like that, I mean, will, will, will be part of what that means. But banking, transportation, borders, parks, you talk about the uh, built environment, I think. Um, ICT, I mean, all, all, it's not, I mean, it, it is, in a way it is disappointing because I was sort of hoping that the law would say, so what they did in Ontario is great, let's do that across the board for everything, but it's really just fairly uh, regulated uh, industries. But it's still a pretty good start. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I guess another um, interesting thing about this is that um, that there, at least in the, the public sector, there's a commitment to go off to hire 5,000 people with disabilities and to, to again, try to make sure that the government is is a leading employer of people with disabilities, and, and that will have an impact as well. I don't think that that employment um, piece filters into the private sector, but it certainly is going to be an impact for, for the government of Canada. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, 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 uh, it's something that, that uh, uh, when the government makes these decisions, like, um, uh, the, the government recently went off and, and spent a billion dollars, yes, that is a billion dollars, on uh, Microsoft Office 360 um, recently. And that's so that for the next 10 years that the government of Canada can go off and have uh, Microsoft Office rolled out across the government of Canada through the new Office 360. In itself, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think there probably are more cost-effective ways to deal with, with improving accessibility for a billion dollars. Um, but but they, they did that because Microsoft has legitimately made some interesting and, and useful improvements on accessibility, particularly in their Microsoft Office suite. But I don't know whether or not they've done things like enable um, the accessibility evaluation tool by default so that all public sector employees are, are cut, their first impression of Microsoft, or the new Microsoft Word, comes with accessibility, um, in a, accessibility enabled by default. And that the accessibility checker needs to be explicitly turned off in order to go off and to to to, uh, to do that. I also don't think they're doing things like let, let, how do we try to make sure that we're aggregating that information to see that that the accessibility that you know how inaccessible documents are in each department or by each staff person, and to see what are you doing to try to make sure that the quality of the documents that are being produced by the government of Canada are are getting more and more accessible over time. So like there's. It's, 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 it's always sort of two steps forward, three steps back, and, and you know, uh, there's a lot of work still to be done. Okay, um, let us move along to our last topic. Uh, AI, how much is hype? Where can we realistically see AI being used in our web projects in the near future? So I guess, AI and CMS. Uh, I was gonna talk about, there's, um, there's one uh, module that I've seen that's already built called uh, Automatic Alternative Text. Right. And um, so it's, um, you know, I've, I've thought about different ways of, that this might be possible, but it uses uh, node pre-save. So um, in node pre-save, when a node is saved, it checks to see if there are any images in the node that don't have uh, alternative text. If they don't, it sends the image to Microsoft Azure. Azure. Right. And then uh, and a caption gets generated automatically. Um, so you know, obviously that's one way to do it. Um, I don't know, like, what, what do you think about uh, about that? I, I'm I'm uh, not a fan of, of a lot of AI, uh, yeah. and and uh, I think there's a lot of good stuff in AI, a lot of potential, but but ultimately people are lazy and people think about AI as a way of replacing people. And if you're selling AI as a replacement for human effort, then, then, then we're, we're not going to get further ahead. It, it's only when we're selling AI as a way to augment or improve um, and, and make it easier to create, create content and actually help coax the user ahead to produce better content that is useful. Like, 
if the if that if that automated captioning tool was engaged when images were uploaded to say, hey, do you is, is this is there, can you approve upon this description of two people standing you know, or the three people sitting at, you know at a podium? Can you can you describe this in more detail so right. to make it appropriate for content? Here's a, here's a suggestion. Here's a suggestion. Make it better. Yeah. Then that would be useful. But that's not what people are doing. Like this module goes off and adds alt text when the user doesn't. Yeah. So they're never going to go back and actually add relevant alt text. They're going to take whatever crappy alt text the engine has produced and and turn that into to the the, uh, the default alt text for the image. Mm -hmm. I'm disappointed because I thought I was not agreeing with you, but then I am. <laughs> <laughs> I was ready for a fight. Um, Exact same thing. I mean, I'm again not a Drupal user, so I'm not aware of how that works in Drupal. But when I hear you say this, what I'm thinking is, why aren't you just flipping that on its head right. and then getting that information and then providing it ahead of time so that we, so that the, the user could eventually update or improve on the object that is automatically generated. Um, whether we're talking about like an automated image recognition algorithm that gets pretty good at describing every like every little piece of an image mm -hmm. and then conveying that as a as a list basically because that's how it started. Uh, I, I think Facebook was the first one doing that in 2016, mm -hmm. where if you were uploading an image and, and you didn't have alt text to it, it would break it down into a bunch of things and tell you and the alt text would be something like this image may contain colon and then two people smiling, blue sky, body of water, boat. And that was it. Mm -hmm. And, and their goal ultimately is to be able to feed that and, and, and work with the information that they know about you to say, it's not just two people smiling, it's actually your sister and her brother. Or your brother. <laughs> um, so, so, so feed that because they know stuff about you. But again, it's always after the fact. So right. I agree with you on that part. I happen to be pretty excited about, about AI in general because I see the potential to make accessibility work easier. Mm -hmm. Not so much because I want to be lazy about it, but because I know people don't necessarily have that as their top priority. Right. And if the tools allow you to do these things, then you might learn to do that yourself. But much like developers today who are taught to use a React or Angular don't really know how to code manually, mm -hmm. I don't know that you need to learn all the nuts and bolts of accessibility to create accessible content. I don't think that you should. Right. So if you have a tool that all of a sudden starts generating captions for you because it, it relies on Google's uh, neural machine translating system, mm -hmm. and then they use that to leverage a particular, uh, like you have, you have, um, you have a speech to text, and then you turn that into a caption, and like all that stuff is automated, and you can, you can automate those captions yourself, mm -hmm. much like you could assume right now but with a more reliable, I guess, or accurate level of, or accurate level of accuracy. Anyway, um, I mean, it's less work for you. Right. So I see a lot of potential in, in things like that. And, and the exciting piece about, about AI is when you look at into all of these little tasks, because basically that's really what that is. I mean, if you go at the, like the essence of what artificial intelligence is and what we're doing is you have one very specific task which can be pretty simple, but it gets to be very, very complex because you don't have the ability to cover all the data that goes with it. Like image recognition in itself is, in and of itself, is very simple when you can recognize an image of a cat because you've already documented millions of images of, of cat. Like the data makes it possible, right. and the computing, the computing power makes it possible. So whether we're talking about the recognition software to help you with with making the uh, the, the, the caption on a video more and more accessible, or you're leveraging the ability to translate content, or the ability to recognize images or recognize spaces, like in Drupal, for instance, another thing that can happen is instead of relying on passwords so much, what if you rely on the camera and you can do that facial recognition much like the, the, uh, the iPhone X is doing now? And like just based on Apple's data when it comes to that, when they introduced the um, Touch ID, uh, so, so this is Apple claiming something, so you, you have to take it for yourself, of course. Because they, they, they would tell you that the error rate with Touch ID was out, one out of 50,000 attempts. You might think your turn was coming regularly, um, but it's one out of 50,000, so they say. 
And with face recognition, they brought it down to one out of a million is not working. So, I mean, there's a lot of improvement there. You don't have to remember, and you know, I mean, you're using your phones to pay stuff or, or anything. You don't have to remember or type in your passwords. That's convenient for us. It's that much more convenient for someone who has difficulty typing, for instance. So all these things improve accessibility. When you have a very, um, very reliable image recognition algorithm, for instance, uh, that you can introduce in an automated testing tool, like, like in Axe 4, for instance, mm -hmm. Right now, it's very easy for us to parse a page and, and extract all the images that don't have an alt attribute, for instance. Mm -hmm. But whether we send it to a cloud or whether we just we can just have our own bank of images that we draw from that would be open source or whatever. I mean, being able to, to use that the same tool and say all of a sudden you have alt text, but it sounds like it's not very accurate. Mm -hmm. Would you like to review this? We could do that in the other tool again. I would not expect someone to have to learn accessibility so much if the tools were better, were getting them better towards the expected outcome. The, the, the big area that I think that, that, that there's there's hope for for me for our for automated. I mean, there's, there are certain things like a plain language. Like there's the the Hemingway app does a great job of trying to go off and produce uh, plain language for English. I don't know if there is an equivalent for French to the Hemingway app, but it's a a really interesting tool. Again, like how do you how do you deal with other languages, whether it's Cree or Ojibwe or Farsi? Like we we, we English is, is, is a, the dominant trade language in, in, the, in tech right now, so all these tools are being built for English. But but you know then there's you know thousands of other languages out there that that, that are not getting the attention and the support that they, they would need. Um, but I, I think that I have a lot of hope for for looking at, at data. So so looking at bugs and code. Um, open source tools are used all over the internet, and um, there's little effort to go off and to take the the bugs that are out there and to fix these problems at the source. Um, tools like Site Improve and Axe Core could be collecting this information and then, then saying, okay, then pointing an AI to that data and saying, okay, where are the bugs? Are there any patterns that we can see here that we can find in the, in the source libraries out there? And we can can we use this these these tools to go off and to submit tentative bugs on these these open source projects so you're able to fix them or at least have somebody look at it and validate it. Like, you know, the, the Axe Core bot thinks this is an issue. Please go off and have a human uh, take a look at, at this issue with this module because it's used by, you know, in according to the ranks, you know, 10,000 websites around the world and is, is, is currently being trafficked by, you know, like a million people a day go off and visit these websites. So please address this if you can. Like, that would be a useful thing to go off and, and generate. Which, which AI could do fairly easily, I think, because it is based on data and code and logic, and, and could allow us to, to more quickly advance and identify some of these issues. Um, that's where I have the hope for, for a lot of AI. All right, I think uh, we've gone over time. <laughs> and I think we have to, uh, to wrap it up, but let's just, because um, no one's kicking us out just yet, um, open it up for, for questions. So I want to go back for the first uh, part of your presentation, uh, of the panel, where you were talking if you do. Okay. Um, I just want to go back to the first part of the panel where you were talking about um, if, if Drupal is the best CMS and it's accessible, um, and then you were comparing it to WordPress, and especially for the Gutenberg. Um, if you want to compare it to WordPress before Gutenberg, how do you, which which one would be more accessible? And I would suggest to, if you want to compare Drupal 7, because Drupal 8 is definitely more accessible than Drupal 7 with a lot of functionality added to the core. So if you want to compare Drupal 7 versus WordPress pre Gutenberg, which which one would be more accessible in that way? Well, I mean, Carl's study basically said that there are more accessible WordPress implementations out there in his study than there are Drupal implementations. And if that's, that's based on, on just a, a, a random sampling of, of tools that tend to be used to be used. It's still something that's, 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 that's a really compelling argument for, for that. And one of the great things the WordPress community has done is they're, they're looking at the WordPress themes and they're evaluating the accessibility of the themes. They have a, a pattern that they're using to say, this theme has been evaluated for accessibility and there's basically a flag that comes up to go and say, this one's good. 
where the Drupal community, we don't have anything like that. We don't have anything like that. And also, like, really impressed by, by the momentum of the WordPress community. There's some really amazing, strong people there. And they have regular meetings that they, they bring people in on Slack and they have discussions, they work through issue queues. The Drupal community has never had that level of organization. And that could be a reflection of how I organize things. But uh, it's a, uh, you know, again, there's some wonderful stuff that's being done there. But, but still, if you're looking at WordPress before Gutenberg, um, they made a commitment to, the WordPress community made a commitment to go up and have every new commit be WK 2.0 AA compliant, but they failed in that. It was just PR. And, and I think that the, the Adomatic folks have not really gotten behind accessibility as much as Breeze and, and the other core maintainers of the Drupal community have gotten behind accessibility. Well, they clearly haven't because, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say that um, that's something that I've been wondering is, you know, the, the way that the security team has their little seal of approval to modules, could we have an accessibility team that adds their accessibility seal to uh, to themes? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, so to your point about whether or not uh, Automatic has, has sort of taken that seriously, if we did not, in own way, completely dismiss that issue to be converted. And it took a huge backlash from the community for them to realize that this was actually something important. And then they contracted uh, Ken to, to get that out of it. Um, you also mentioned the other thing that I want to talk about, which is the accessibility teams or the accessibility red teams in WordPress. Um, I, I, yes, those exist. But I, I don't know that it's fair to compare. That's the thing. I don't know that it's fair to compare how many sites come out as accessible from WordPress or from Drupal. Drupal, I mean, WordPress powers about a third of the sites on the web, basically. So in comparison, with all due respect, in comparison, Drupal is it's 3%. a very small piece. 3%, 3%. Whole percent, right? three whole percent. <laughs> but I mean, in comparison, it's not, it's not as much. So, so when you, if you take a sample of 100 sites, you are much more likely to find accessible sites in Drupal than you are that are powered by WordPress, just because of the sheer amount of, of sites that are out there. So the comparison is not that fair, unless the comparison was made with sites from the same related sector using either one of those tools, then you could, like you're talking about like, uh, sites, sites from like the uh, scanner right. Sites that are either run or, or, or made for people that have disabilities or representable disabilities, the quality, so to speak, of the accessibility piece in each of those, like which one is the best? Um, because even if the, the like accessibility ready sites or themes or whatever in WordPress, even if you use those, you can still screw it up really bad if you don't know what you're doing. So maybe your your starting point is not bad, but if you start if you don't know what you're doing, you can screw that up really quickly. So it would not be accessible. It's not a, it's not a guarantee it will be also. Um, and just a follow up question, you you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, WordPress with Gutenberg is not as accessible as it was before. Were you talking about Gutenberg as an admin interface or as whatever whatever you update your content wise, the code that's published is accessible? I was talking about the, the admin interface itself. Um, okay. I don't know, I haven't heard any evaluations of how, how the output from Gutenberg is in terms of accessibility. It, it might be fun. Okay. Yeah, from what I can tell, it's still based on the themes that you use. If you still use an accessibility red theme, you would do pretty well. The backlash really was because all of a sudden people that were had a disability were not no longer able to use the interface, the admin, once they moved to version five. Okay. Uh, so pretty pretty big deal, of course, if you if you've been used to the the, the autonomous doing that, and all of a sudden you can't anymore. All right, um, we have to wrap it up, so thanks everybody. That was really fun.